All right, I'm super excited to be here with two brilliant gentlemen, both from Sherdbits, and they're going to be talking to you guys about discrete log contracts. Uh, I would like to introduce you guys first to Nadav Cohen. Uh, welcome to uh, Technical Tuesday, Nadav. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, Nadal, uh, what do you do at Sherbits, and uh, I guess what's your kind of like brief story on uh, how you know how you got into all this? Yeah, um, I'm a software engineer. I've been at Sherbits since May of 2018 when I graduated from college. Uh, I d knew nothing about anything. Well, that's a lie. I knew nothing about Bitcoin when I joined in May of 2018, but picked it up kind of as I went. Um, I have a math and a CS background, so. It was a good fit and it's really cool stuff. And then uh, at some point, like last year, I started getting super into the more kind of R&D side of Bitcoin with fancy new stuff. Amazing. Which, Amazing. Yeah. Um, and then, Ben, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ben, also a dev at Shirtbits. Uh, I got into Bitcoin um, like late 2017 during the, you know, the hype. And then uh, started getting into development uh, end of 2018, doing this like small PRs on Bitcoin Core. And I worked on Wasabi for a little bit that summer. And then last November, I started at Sharedbits and have been loving it ever since. Amazing. Well, again, thank you both for coming on to explain your work to the Bitcoin Magazine audience. Um, I mean, I guess without further ado, do you just want to get into your presentation and I'll, I'll get out of here? Sure thing. Let's do it. Good to go. Sweet. Um, yeah, well, we've already introduced ourselves. I'm Nadav, that's Ben, and we're here to talk about discrete log contracts. Um, yeah, so when I talk about, or discrete log contracts are Bitcoin Oracle contracts. And at a high level, all that means is that um, on top of things you can already do with Bitcoin outputs, like time locks and uh, you know signature locks, or you know you need to sign with a certain pub key in order to spend these funds, or hash locks, and all these other kinds of ways of making payments conditioned on something. Uh, discrete log contracts enable a new kind of lock that you know you could think of as like an oracle lock, where an oracle has to say that a certain thing happened for these funds to be spendable. Uh, and actually, you can do something a little more general where like the funds get spent different ways, depending on what actually happened, according to an Oracle. So um, DLCs allow you to take kind of these external to the blockchain real life events um, and create uh, transactions based on these real life or external events uh, that are enforced using um, digital signatures. Uh, and as opposed to uh, some other, you know, kind of simple Oracle schemes that you might be able to come up with uh, that we'll talk more about uh, later on in this presentation, like things that look more like escrows, uh, discrete log contracts really focus on privacy and scalability. Uh, most of the contents of the Oracle contracts remain off chain, meaning that um, you, you end up signing a bunch of transactions to kind of ensure that this Oracle lock goes through regardless of what happens in the real life event um, or the external event. But um, most of that stuff never hits the blockchain. So that's good for privacy and scalability. Uh, and the on-chain footprint to be specific is super minimal as you'll see on this next slide. But um, essentially not only is there almost nothing that goes on-chain but of the transaction that does go on-chain uh, even the Oracle itself, who um, you're using as the Oracle in your Oracle lock, can't tell that they've been used. So that is kind of uh, privacy and scalability, you know, usually go hand in hand, because usually what you're trying to do in the Bitcoin space is keep as much as you can off of the blockchain. Um, and this kind of ties into uh, another core aspect of discrete log contracts that we're going to talk about today, which is trust mitigation, uh, which will have plenty of slides on later. So moving it right along, uh, I mentioned that the on-chain footprint is really small. Uh, and specifically what it is uh, today, even pre-Taproot, um, is a single on-chain transaction. Uh, so you have uh, 
two people say who are entering into a discrete log contract say that uh, Alice and Bob here are speculating on whether or not the price of Bitcoin will be above or below $10,000 by the end of this week. And they have some Oracle who's publishing either Moon or Crash, uh, Moon for if the price is above 10K and Crash otherwise. Um, and you know they agree to some terms. Um, they each fund this um, contract. So they each are putting in one Bitcoin uh, what you see on chain is a, a, what's called a funding transaction, which has two parties sending money in, and then it's being held there in a two for two multi sig. And then um, later on, after the Oracle has published, say that Alice was betting that it would go up and moon, whereas Bob was betting that it would stay under 10K and crash, say that uh, Alice is right and it's over 10K at the end of this weekend then um, all you'll see on chain is a transaction spending this funding transaction, sending 1.5 Bitcoin to Alice and 0.5 Bitcoin to Bob in this case. Um, and you see nothing else on chain. You can't distinguish what Oracle was used. It looks like a normal kind of two people sending, or maybe even one person consolidating funds into a single output and then that output being sent out to two uh, different addresses. Um, yeah, but before we move on, I'll hand it over to Ben to talk about use cases. Yeah, so um, before we get started on how this actually all works, you want to know like why exactly you'd want to use this. So the first obvious use case would be any financial derivative where you want to like be making a bet or uh, doing some like financial contracts, so, like a colored future contract. Say um, that's where like you have a min and a max uh, value for something. Let's say like a presidential election, you can either get zero uh, electorates or 538. So you could place a bet like the min zero, max 538, and the oracle signing how many which candidate gets. And then uh, your contract would be based off that. Or I could do a contract for difference. This is like like for in a, if you're doing a Bitcoin price uh, contract for difference, it'd be like, what's the difference in price from like 7 p.m. today versus yesterday? So then you could be betting like, will it change over $100? Will it stay the same? Will it move at 10K? Whatever you want. Or then um, you can get into more fancy things like synthetic assets and uh, DEX trading. What a synthetic asset is, it's like RGB, where you can do like a Tether token or a gold token or Ethereum Tron token, whatever you want on like Lightning or something, where you're then uh, making bets based off uh, those assets instead of having to denominate back into Bitcoin. Or you could do DEX trading, where you know you're you're trading assets in a decentralized way and uh, not needing any like custodial funds. But uh, another great use case for this is prediction markets. So basically any public event that you'd want to do where you could have some Oracle just signing like, you know, oh, the Patriots won the Super Bowl. You know, there's a hurricane coming tomorrow or an election if you, you know, I, I think X person is going to win the election or even uh, like you want to go on uh, and bet how many times Trump's going to tweet today, you can bet on that. And uh, anything that's basically ser serializable and open to the public can be bet on. But uh, the first problem we need to get into for talking how these works is the Oracle problem. What this is, is basically the problem of getting external data from uh, Bitcoin back into the chain. So if you want to make, a, obviously, a bet like on who's going to win the presidential election, Bitcoin doesn't know about the election at all. It doesn't care. So you need someone to say X event happened, you know, Biden won the presidency and you can put that uh, data into the chain. So how we use this is the signatures. And another problem you need, you know, you need to trust the use people on who they're going to do it and what ways of mitigating that trust. And, you know, if they're going to collude or bri get bribed or they're being basically a nefarious actor you should maybe have ways to punish that. And DLCs have uh, an elegant solution as well. And also you want to preserve your privacy from your Oracle optimally. So you don't want to have to, you know, have them assign your actual transaction and know that like whose funds are going where or like which transaction is actually reliant on the contract as well as then it's better for you. So now your privacy isn't leaking and it's better for the Oracle because now they don't need to deal with the regulatory pressure of you know having partial custody of someone's funds or even knowing who's using them. So there's less uh, third parties to trust. But then Nadav is going to get into the solution on how DLCs fix all that.
Yeah, so um, the discrete log contract kind of paradigm for dealing with oracles and the oracle problem is that um, kind of the first and foremost, you shouldn't have to place any kind of trust in your counterparty. Most any solution to the oracle problem kind of has this tenant, you shouldn't have to trust your counterparty, then it's not trustless um, in, in any sense. Um, and so one thing that is kind of unique, at least in some senses, to discrete log contracts as opposed to some other Oracle schemes that exist is that um, the Oracles are oblivious and passive. So as Ben alluded to, uh, the Oracle doesn't play an active role in your contracts. They don't need to know about your contract. In fact, they shouldn't be able to know about your contract. All they need to do is watch something that's happening publish a signature about some external data and broadcast it. They shouldn't know who their users are. They shouldn't know how their users are using their signatures. They shouldn't even know like the kinds of contracts that necessarily are being constructed around their signatures. People can do all sorts of customizable things and it's all on the user's end. And the Oracle doesn't need to know anything about it. And in fact, uh, if all parties are being honest, they will never know that they were even used um, necessarily. Uh, so this is kind of what I mean by oblivious and passive. Uh, having an oracle be oblivious and passive creates a giant barrier to collusion and bribery. You know, it's gonna gonna be hard for an oracle if they don't have you know a willing participant. They can't like ask to be bribed, for example. And also, you know, privacy is just a good thing generally speaking. You also don't want other traders to know what your trades you've been executing have been because um, you know, people are generally pretty secretive about their trading algorithms. Um, uh, another thing that is important uh, that is present in discrete log contracts is that if an oracle is cheating, then this is detectable and easily provable because as we've kind of mentioned many times now, all of these oracles need to do is publish signatures of events. And if they publish a signature of an event that didn't happen or that happened differently, then now everyone has this signature with this public key that couldn't have been forged that um, this oracle lied about something. And so uh, it's, it's good that it's detectable. And we'll talk about more what we can do beyond just detecting when an oracle has done something wrong. But the fact that it's detectable means that uh, uh, you know, if, if people want to, they can, you know, have at least some sense of like reputation or something like that. I mean, we, because of various other things, we're not at a stage where we're worried about reputation systems for oracles, but, um, you know, it's certainly not a good thing if you can't detect when oracles are cheating and it's very easy to detect in discrete log contracts when they are. Um, kind of a property, uh, that is uh, that discrete log contract oracles have that uh, further uh, increases the security of kind of this oracle trust is that you can compose multiple oracles together. And there are a couple ways you can do this. The simplest way is just um, in order for funds to be spent, require that like multiple oracles say to agree on an event that happened. Uh, this is particularly, uh, you know, easy to do if you have like a finite number of outcomes, if it's not like a price and it's just like, you know, who won an election or uh, ranges for like how many times someone tweeted in a day or something like this. Uh, and because you have these composable oracles, this super raises the barrier to collusion and bribery because now you need to bribe more than one entity, more than one oracle. And you need to have more than uh, a couple corrupt oracles in order to actually get anything to work. Um, and all of the cheating that would happen here would be detectable and provable. Um, and another way that you can compose them, which is a little more complicated, but still totally doable, is you can do kind of the normal, you know, multi-sig scheme where you have a threshold T of a total of N oracles. And so long as like, say three of five of them or four or five of them agree on an event, then that is what happened. Um, and then kind of this last but super major thing that is built into just discrete log contract oracles is that um, if an oracle ever does a certain kind of cheating called equivocation. Uh, so equivocation just means that an oracle says multiple things happen. So they sign multiple different uh, messages for the same event saying, say, it was both over and under 10K or anything like this. 
Um, if an oracle ever equivocates, then anyone who sees these two signatures, two or more signatures, can derive the oracle signing private keys. And so this means a couple of things. First of all, it means no one should ever use this oracle with this key again, because some random person or any random person can derive and sign for this oracle now. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you can have Oracle stake funds publicly on pay to pub key addresses uh, on their signing keys. And so this kind of should increase their trustworthiness because if they ever equivocate, then they actually lose funds by doing so. Um, so these are the major ways in which the discrete log contract um, paradigm kind of approaches the Oracle problem at a high level. You know, there's no way to remove trust entirely if you want to bring external data onto the blockchain. And there are lots of times when you do want to bring external data onto the blockchain. And so really the question is, how do you mitigate that trust? How do you spread it around amongst trustworthy oracles? And how do you kind of keep a barrier between the oracles and the users? Um, and so let's talk a little bit more about that now as we go into how you actually are doing these oracle contracts. So we've been talking at a pretty high level. Uh, we have mentioned what actually goes on chain here on the left we have kind of a more detailed depiction of uh, kind of everything that's going into a discrete log contract so um say you know we have alice and bob same situation as earlier uh, alice wins if it's if the price is over 10k at the end of the weekend bob wins otherwise uh, the first thing they need to do to set up a discrete log contract is they need to find an oracle and the oracle needs to have committed to this event meaning like over under 10k at a certain time this weekend uh, and how an oracle commits to an event is that it publishes public keys so there's one public key that's just that oracle's signing key that should just like be a static thing that always exists for that oracle but then on top of that for every event on which they're going to publish a signature they need a new public key that is specifically dedicated for that event so first, those public keys need to exist and this oracle needs to exist. But once uh, you know, they found an oracle or multiple, but for simplicity's sake, let's just talk about the single oracle case for now. Uh, so Alice and Bob have found some oracle, then they agree on terms um, saying you know, how much each party is going to input and then on each of the possible outcomes. Uh, in this case, there are only two, but you could imagine there being like thousands and thousands of outcomes if like the Oracle was signing a price or something more complicated, uh, or if you're composing multiple oracles from different events and you have like these composed events and things like this. But essentially you need to kind of list out all the possible things that you care about as outcomes. And then uh, for each of these outcomes, you need to determine who gets how much. Um, and then, you know, you also have to have who's funding how much. And once you've agreed to these terms, uh, now you can start building out these transactions. So first, without any signing, you build out all of the transactions depicted over on the left. We have our funding transaction, which just takes in the funding inputs from Alice and Bob uh, and spits out a two of two multisig with Alice and Bob each part uh, of the multisig. And then uh, you build a CET or contract execution transaction uh, for each possible event. So in this case, there are only two. There's the over 10K and the under 10K. But as I mentioned earlier, if you're looking at more complicated events, every single possible event that you care about, uh, you know, be that a range of things or just, you know, say every price would have a different one is also possible. Um, then you have to build a CET for each one. And all the CET does is it spends the funding transaction and outputs to Alice and Bob the amount they're due for that event. So very kind of simple transactions here so far. We've got the funding transaction, which is just taking in funds, spitting out a two of two multi-sig with Alice and Bob. Uh, and then we have these CETs spending the funding transaction and then spitting funds out to Alice and Bob, where each CET represents a different event happening in the real world. And then lastly, we have a refund transaction, uh, which takes the funding transaction, it spends the funding transaction, and it outputs the amount that each Alice and Bob put in. So it refunds their uh, amounts. But uh, the difference here with the refund transaction is that it has a time lock on it. So the, this transaction only becomes valid after a certain amount of time. Normally, you would set this time to be well, well after you, you expect a signature from the Oracle. So this is just in case like your oracles go offline or you had not thought of some event and you know some event that you hadn't thought of was the one that happened or 
you know, just generally, this is more of kind of an engineering thing. In a perfect world, we wouldn't need a refund transaction, but we live in an imperfect world. And so we always throw a refund transaction on there. Action, almost ready to go. All you have to do is sign them. Because you can imagine once we have everything signed in the funding transaction on chain, uh, we should be good to go. But there's a kind of a caveat. We only want one of the CETs to become valid. Um, we only want CETs to become valid when they correspond to an event that happened in the real world, which in this case is actually going to be proxied by when an Oracle publishes a signature for this specific event. And so uh, how we do this is rather than providing your counterparty with an actual signature, you give them what's called an adapter signature. So an adapter signature is uh, this fancy crypto magic, which lets you give someone an invalid signature that's tweaked using a public key. So uh, this public key that you're tweaking by uh, has to do with the public key that was published for this event and the event itself, the message that would be signed in this event. Um, and then if the Oracle ever publishes a signature, then the kind of private key to this tweak would become revealed and someone would be able to kind of untweak this invalid signature to generate a valid signature. So the idea is each party gives the other party a bunch of invalid signatures, one for every CET, where the signature for each CET is tweaked by that event's key, by that event's signature. Um, and then later on during execution, only one of those is ever going to become valid. So once you've given all of your adapter signatures on your CETs, then everyone signs the funding transaction, someone publishes it, and then that's the only thing that ends up on chain. All this other stuff underneath the funding transaction is still off chain. And then uh, for execution of a discrete log contract, all that happens is an Oracle broadcasts a signature. Um, this makes, as I mentioned, exactly one of the contract execution transactions valid because um, all uh, you, both parties will now have valid signatures because they were given an invalid signature. But this um, Oracle broadcasted signature lets them kind of untweak it and get a good signature for the CET, which they can then broadcast. Either party can broadcast the CET, which will send funds to Alice and Bob as should happen when the Oracle is done. Um, and all other transactions remain invalid. None of these other CETs are ever going to become valid. And furthermore, um, you know, you spent the funding transaction, so no one can double spend that anyway. Um, yeah, and that's kind of the nitty gritty of how these DLCs, uh, at least in kind of the simplest case, uh, are executed. And uh, without further ado, I think we're going to go over to the demo portion before kind of coming back and looking at the future. Yeah, so um, before this, I set up two wallets, um, both with some reg test funds in them to execute a DLC for you guys. Um, I think those are showing up on the screen well. So uh, the, before we get started though, we need an Oracle and we made a little demo Oracle tool on here just to make it easier. So, um, oh, whoops. so we need a couple of outcomes. Uh, for this case, we'll do like the moon and crash case. So um, we'll do that. And then we'll say we'll, we're taking the moon case because number always goes up. So we'll do, we'll win 10K on the moon case and then we'll put zero for the crash case because our other party would win the funds in that case. And this is in Satoshi's by the way, not Bitcoin, yeah. we're not crazy. I wish I was that rich. So um, this generated a whole bunch of info for us. First, we got an Oracle public key. This is just the Oracle's public key that they'll use for every event. But this is their R value. This is a public key that they're using specifically for this event. And then uh, their Oracle info is just those two combined. It's right next to each other. This is what we'll enter into our uh, DLC offer. And then we have a hash of the each outcome. So this is the moon case, the hash of moon, and this is a hash of crass with the amounts next to them, just giving us what the Oracle would be signing. And that is then serialized into a contract info, which we'll be using to uh, like negotiate with our other party. And then here we have the two signatures. Uh, normally an Oracle wouldn't do this, but we have them pre-signed both outcomes so we can use that to execute. So we'll go and offer and I'll put um, the contract info and Oracle info, info for us. And for the collateral, we have to put up some Satoshis. So we'll say um, 6,000 Satoshis because we don't want to fund the entire thing. And then we need a lock time for this. So we'll say at block 100, it'll happen. And then our refund is when 
like Nadav explained earlier, when if the Oracle went away, they would, uh, we, then the both come invalid and we can refund it. So we'll, we'll do the 200 and we just need a fee rate. We'll do three sats per byte. And I'll give us a huge, nice uh, offer. So what we have again here is the hash of the outcomes and uh, the amounts that we're doing with. So a thousand for the moon case and, and then we win zero for the crash case. And we have our Oracle info. And then here we have funding keys. Um, so this is the key that would be used in the two of two multi-sig. And this is the key we're receiving on with an address and then uh, how much we're putting up. And then our funding input. So these are what we're actually funding the DLC with. So it's got an out point and then this script for the output and an address that we receive our change on, a fee rate, and then those timeouts we put earlier. So then we can take all this and send it to our party and they'll accept our offer. They'll just paste this in. And they produce an accept message. So they're putting up the 4,000 of the, uh, so that's the 10,000 minus our collateral, so 4,000. Then they have their own funding keys and then the keys they're receiving on, their own inputs and change address. But here they're doing signatures. So they're gonna sign the moon case, the crash case, and then the refund case as well. And then they give us an event ID so we can uh, find this later. And they can give that to us. And we'll sign the DLC because we have not signed it yet. So that'll, um, then we produce some CET SIG. So our, um, for the moon case, we produce the signature. For the crash case, we produce the signature. For the refund case, we produce the signature. And then we also signed our funding inputs. So then we can give this to our counterparty again. They'll add the signatures to themselves. And now that we've successfully set up the DLC so we can get our funding transaction. Oops, we need our event ID. And now we've su successfully set up our DLC. So we have a funding transaction published and now all we need to do is wait for an Oracle to give us a signature and then we can execute. So after doing so, we'll say at the end of the day, uh, Bitcoin moons and we won. So we go here, they'd send us our signature either through like some peer to peer network or however they want to offer to us. And we go to close, they give us our, we have the event ID, enter a signature. And there we go, we produce two transactions, one spending the funding output and then we just send it to ourselves just to be sure. But if we didn't want to, we could also refund it and then, oops that would give us um, a different transaction that would refund it and then send it to us again. But yeah, uh, we'll continue on. Yeah, so that's kind of what the process looks like uh, in setting up and executing a discrete log contract. So, you know, in some contexts that won't be done manually, uh, though I guess in some it will. Um, so, yeah. yeah, but Ben, take it away. Yeah, so this is the timeline of like the DLCs and how they've progressed. So back in 2017, Taj Dreija from uh, he works at MIT, part of the Digital Currency Initiative. He uh, published a paper then and uh, got a little bit of buzz. And then in April of 2019, the Crypto Garage guys and Blockstream uh, manually executed a DLC on mainnet. They like you know they didn't have any libraries or any nice tools to do that easily. They had to like modify the signatures and pub keys themselves but they actually did one on chain. And then uh, back in December, 2019, us and Crypto Garage started working on a, like a bolt like specification of how to like, uh, how these transactions should be formatted and you know, how we should negotiate them, try to standardize it so we could have multiple working clients. And then back in February, we had uh, a minimal implementation similar to the one we just showed you, where um, we had compatible and we can execute reg test and test net DLCs. And then back in of May of 2020, we started moving to this adapter signature uh, spec. And uh, with the help from like Lord Fournier and uh, Nickler and Waxwing, we got an ECDSA adapter signature implementation going. And now with like Anton Riard and um, some of those guys as well, uh, with the crypto guys still, we're working on uh, changing the DLC spec to be using adapter signatures for a much cleaner DLCs. Yeah, so um, kind of going off of that, uh, the original DLC spec, uh, this was before we knew that we could really do adapter signatures using ECDSA. The plan originally was that once we had Schnorr, we would use uh, adapter signatures to kind of clean up all of our 
DLCs, but it turns out, as uh, Lloyd discovered and kind of proved out, uh, that there is a way to do uh, adapter signatures and adapter sig schemes uh, just on ECDSA so that we can actually do this on Bitcoin today. Um, and so kind of next steps at Shared Bits and also other places where people are working on DLCs, um, we want to kind of update the uh, DLC specification, which was a work in progress to begin with, to um, kind of A, be prettier, more you know, formal, look more like kind of how professional the bolts for lightning look. Um, and then we also want to kind of rewrite uh, the scheme to use adapter signatures as we've described them today. Previously, without adapter signatures, it was still possible to do discrete log contracts. It was just significantly more complicated with the whole punishment mechanism with illegal states and all this other stuff, uh, which kind of just got wiped out by the use of adapter signatures, which was awesome. Uh, if you're interested in uh, what DLCs kind of, what the outline for the new specification is going to look like, uh, we kind of have a meta spec or like what we want to, everything in our spec to include. Um, is linked on the slide here. I think we either already have or will tweet out these slides, so feel free to click on that. Um, so while we work on uh, you know, modifying, rewriting the specification, we also want to modify and simplify our current implementation. Um, so like the one you just saw, we're working on um, a library for constructing kind of arbitrary DLCs uh, that was, is going to go along with the specification, and I know that Crypto Garage is also working on at least one implementation of discrete log contracts. Um, and we, you know, we just have to rewrite uh, these implementations to use adapter signatures, which should hopefully simplify everything in our lives. Um, and then uh, kind of concurrently with both of those things as well, we want to build out more discrete log contract oracles and write uh, kind of specify standardize uh, best practices um, for these discrete log contract oracles. Uh, right now, we, we have kind of this demo one, uh, like a real demo one, not the one we just showed you, uh, that's up and running on a server on testnet uh, that does kind of these moon crash takes on various trading pairs on various exchanges. Uh, the API docs are linked there. Um, but we want to work on, you know, getting a better spec, getting better implementations, and uh, writing out some more oracles. Um, and those are kind of the immediate next steps at Shared Bits. Uh, and I guess I'll hand it over to Ben again to talk about some stuff that might be possible in the future. Next, next steps, if you will. Yeah, yeah. So everyone loves Lightning and you know cheap, fast transactions. So uh, you can do DLCs on Lightning, luckily. There's two ways to do them. I'm going to talk about uh, what uh, a general DLC channel is. So this is um, like you can't do it like routed across the network. But you know, if you already have a channel established with your counterparty, you could do a DLC with them and then not need to publish any transactions directly on the chain as long as everyone stays complicit. So how you do that is instead of uh, creating an HTLC output onto your channel, you make a DLC output, which would just be another two of two multisig, and then um. After that, you would then just do a similar execution where you're you're going to do all the adapter sigs and uh, you know tweak them by the Oracle expected public key. And then after you get the Oracle signature, then you can uh, execute these CTs and then uh, execute back into your channel. If your party's being honest, though, then you would just mutually close the DLC back into your Lightning channel with whoever is getting the winnings back into the, their side of the channel. And you never even broadcast a transaction on chain. You're saving then by privacy because you know now no one ever knows that you did this, and you're saving tons on fees because obviously no on chain fees. Also, um, with that you could do channel factories where you could spin up like a whole bunch of them for like some trading pool where you know some maybe some large corporations want to hedge bets or something. You could do like that where you have like 20 participants all doing some advanced trading scheme and they'd uh, route them all together. But uh, we need uh, Sigcash no input or something to get channel factories going. But I'll give it to Nadav to talk about PTLCs. Yeah. So as Ben just mentioned, you know, one way of doing Lightning DLCs is just putting, uh, as opposed to hash lock, hash time locked outputs on Lightning channels, you could throw Oracle locked outputs on them. Uh, but this only works if you have two parties and they have a channel open already. So um, this other way of doing things on Lightning um, with DLCs 
uh, allows for you to actually not have a channel open with the person who you're opening a DLC with and rather route through the network to execute this DLC, um, like we kind of expect with HTLCs. Um, so the change that is required here is um, rather than using HTLCs, you need to use what are called PTLCs. So that's point time lock contracts. So this is a change that's going to happen someday in the Lightning Network is we're going to get rid of HTLCs and move to PTLCs. If you have questions and are wondering why, I've written many a blog post about how great PTLCs are and why they're better in every way and how we're going to get them and when we're going to get them and all these other things. But um, so once we have PTLCs on the Lightning Network, then uh, two unconnected parties are going to be able to route a DLC through the network so that they can actually execute um, discrete log contracts uh, without having to even have channels open with one another. Uh, and just like in general channels, this means setup and settlement is entirely off chain. Uh, the kind of trade off here or one of the trade-offs here is that um, this requires uh, the existence of these things called barrier escrows, which I've also written extensively about and don't wanna get too much into here, but at a high level um, in the future, uh, we are going to be able to execute DLCs off-chain and kind of more generally uh, off-chain kind of lightning-ish schemes are going to be able to use Oracle locks as kind of a primitive on the lightning network which is going to be super neat. Um, yeah, and then so just kind of wrapping up, talking about the future in general. Uh, you know, the first thing that needs to happen is we need to finish what we're working on right now, which is a specification, implementations, libraries, you know, all the usual stuff. And then kind of future work, kind of fancy stuff. We've got um, a bunch of different ways that you can, well, not a bunch of different ways. We've got a way that you can transfer DLCs from one party to another. Uh, we can do this, and when I said a bunch of different ways, I was thinking there's a way to do it on chain, there's a way to do it in a single channel over Lightning, and there's a way to do it with routed routing over Lightning. In all cases, it is possible to transfer these discrete log contracts, so you're not locked into them forever if you want to say, say it's a financial derivative and you want to sell it to someone else, as is expected to be possible with financial derivatives, that's totally doable. Um, we also have these two different ways of doing lightning DLCs that we're interested in pursuing. Um, we have this idea for a future where um, there's actual P2P networks dedicated to discrete log contracts, uh, or at least that you can do discrete log contracts over, as opposed to say, you know, kind of doing things out of band like Ben just did with himself during the demo, or, you know, using IRC or kind of this uh, over the counter kind of frame of mind for setting up DLCs. In the future, we want to have kind of this P2P network where people can negotiate DLCs um, and also possibly have oracles kind of gossip their signatures around. So there's even more anonymity between the users and the oracles for how they kind of distribute those signatures. And then, you know, in the distant futures, you know, thoughts about we can do synthetic assets, which Ben alluded to is a way of kind of um, using very small time period contract for differences to kind of simulate having some other asset on chain or on the lightning network. Um, and then there's DLC channel factories. Once we have channel factories, then hopefully we can also do DLCs in those channel factories. Um, and then also there's this cool idea that uh, we've been churning through uh, that Ben has called chow main DLCs, which essentially involve taking coin joins and DLCs and putting them together and having it so that multiple people doing DLCs or even some of them doing coin joins and some of them doing DLCs kind of get together and do one big coin join that also acts as a discrete log contract for all the parties involved who want to be part of a discrete log contract. Um, yeah, so these are kind of a quick run through of all the cool things we've written about, I think, all of these things on our blog if people are interested. And also, if you have questions about them, feel free to ask, because I think it's time for Q&A. Uh, but Ben, go to the next slide just so that we have resources as well on these slides that y'all can look at. Yeah, but um, I think we're good to do some Q&A now. Um, and we, we've got some more slides on some of the futuristic things if people ask stuff about them. Awesome. Uh, if you want to switch back uh, to the turn off sharing your screen, Ben. 
Yeah. All right. Very cool. Uh, so uh, the viewers are a little shy right now and haven't hit us <laughs> with any questions quite yet, but I came prepared. Um, so I think the first thing here is like obviously you guys painted a picture of a vibrant a potential vibrant DLC community where people DLC technology is interacting with a lot of other Bitcoin technology and you know potentially people could be coin joining into their discrete log contracts. Um, what do you think it's going to take to get from here uh, to a point where uh, DLC DLCs are widely adopted? Uh a lot of work and um hopefully you know once once we've got past this kind of proof of concept stage hopefully the the real work begins so to speak um i mean ben you can say more about this but i i i kind of have in mind there are kind of two different pieces to this one is actually kind of bootstrapping an oracle ecosystem where we need to have, you know, a variety of reliable oracles um, of various kinds. You know, some might be open source, some might be closed source, some might be run by corporations, some might be run by individuals, you know, whatever it may be. We want to have like a nice uniform kind of oracle standardization where you can compose all of these different oracles. We want these oracles to exist, have reasons to exist. We've talked a lot about using the Lightning Network and the privacy that comes along with the Lightning Network to monetize oblivious oracles. So like they still don't learn who their users are, but their users are able to pay them for signatures in an atomic way, uh, things like this. Um, so that's kind of one aspect to it, I think, is we're gonna need to have a, a healthy Oracle ecosystem where truth is not determined by like a single company. Um, as much as I'd love to be the one determining <laughs> what the truth is. Um, so that's, that's kind of one part of it. And then, you know, the other part is largely we need, you know, a bunch of, you know, open source clients, libraries, specifications around these things. Um, and at some point, you know, we got to start getting that UX better right now. You saw what we have. It's, you know, a little clunky, copy paste, um, um, lots of JSON, lots of clicking. Uh, and in the future, we're hoping that that's all going to be super smoothed over. And I know that Crypto Garage is working on, on that as well, uh, along with some other people. Uh, ben, anything to add? Yeah, I agree with you for the most part. Yeah, the ma I think the major hurdle is getting um, like people aware that they can actually do this and then it into wallets so they can go ahead and execute these themselves without needing to, you know, go to some other wallet or have to do something. It'd be nice, you know, you just on your wallet, you go to the DLC tab and say, you know, I want to bet Bitcoin's going up today. You go ahead and do that without needing to, you know, like send funds to another wallet and, you know, have to copy paste against all your peers. It'd be nice to just have a nice uh, UX flow, which is, I think, will be the major hurdle. But, I mean, it all does is take time. And I think in a few years, it's completely possible. Yeah. And I also just like to note, I mean, as we kind of talked about during the, the progress uh, slide some, some time ago, uh, you know, DLCs. Uh, have only really been, people have only been working on developing them in kind of an automated way for like under a year. And I feel like we've come quite a ways, like we have working proof of concept of, of a lot of this stuff. Uh, and we've kind of fleshed out most of the ideas that we need in order to get this stuff to work. And at this point, it's really just a lot of like dirty engineering, you know, details that need to get fleshed out and, um, you know, security concerns, privacy concerns. Um, kind of just trying to get make sure we get it right and then once we have it it hopefully from there just becomes you know another thing we need to scale out into the bitcoin ecosystem and um you know it kind of introduces this whole new primitive that ties bitcoin to kind of the real world of contracts or whatever you want to call it and so i think it's it's going to be super attractive to a lot of people yeah, I mean, n nothing gets uh, people in finance more excited than smart contracts. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, oh, what yeah. are the biggest attack vectors since, you know, it seems like there's still some work to be done on that front? Yeah, um, so I think most of the concerns are to do with oracles, as it always is with these kinds of things. Um, the good news is that um, users choose oracles as opposed to the other way around, as I know it is in a lot of smart contracting ecosystems. Uh, you know, users can pick who they trust, how they trust them, 
whether they're spreading their trust between multiple parties or just a couple, um, all these kinds of things. So there's a lot that's just like, you know, giving the users the power to choose how they want to distribute their trust. Um, and then past that, it's just a matter, most of the security is just securing the oracles. So it's going to be a matter of getting a healthy Oracle ecosystem where people have good practices or taking care of their keys, you know, maybe even keeping their keys cold almost all the time, uh, protecting themselves in kind of the usual key management ways. Um, other than that, the, the discrete log contract kind of scheme itself uh, is, is somewhat ironclad. Once you've entered into an agreement, you don't need your counterparty to complete it. Um, you don't need your counterparty for anything. You just kind of are, are in that agreement. Um, yeah, so most of the, most all the security concerns are really just the normal, like, well, make sure the Oracle doesn't get hacked because that would be bad. And then for the users, make sure you aren't trusting any one Oracle too much. Make sure that you're, you know, kind of diversifying your trust in some sense. Uh, security is kind of super interwoven with, uh, yeah, just how secure the Oracles are and also how private uh, you keep yourselves from the Oracles. And on that front, I'm not too worried. Yeah, what's really nice too is um, a lot of the security concerns are like almost the same as Lightning, and there's like whole f ecosystem trying to solve that problem. So, um, if they can figure out, we can just basically port it to the Oracles or DLCs, and we've largely worked on the same problem there. So, it should like most of the security terms are solvable. Okay, um, that's positive for sure. And kind of speaking about oracles kind of being at the center of what could go wrong, why would a company or organization want to become an oracle? I know that you guys at Shared Bits are, you know, obviously trying to bootstrap and going to be offering some oracle services. Can you talk a little bit about why other companies would start to join that effort? Yeah, a um, couple of reasons that come to mind. Uh, one is if you can monetize it. Uh, at Shared Bits, we're thinking a lot about how to kind of have these oracles that um, you contact asking for keys over the Lightning Network through this nice mixed onion routed. Set up a payment in such a way, and this uses PTLCs, but you can also do it with a bit more trust in us using HTLCs, where you kind of atomically um, pay us for the signature, meaning that the receipt, so in the Lightning Network, there's kind of this proof of payment or receipt of your payment that you get if and only if the payment goes through. And we have a way of kind of making that receipt, the actual like signature and public key that you need from the Oracle. And so there are still ways that you can monetize without giving up on privacy. Um, so that's one reason that someone might wanna become an Oracle is because maybe it's profitable, especially if you have like a brand name associated with you. Uh, another reason might be that you want uh, to kind of get monetized on the back end of that. So like, you know, you could imagine exchanges right now, they're just giving away all their data for free anyway. Crypto exchanges, not real or not uh, traditional ones. Um, they, I, I could easily see them kind of broadcasting signatures on the data that they're publishing. Coinbase is already kind of doing this for some Ethereum schemes um, where they have like a Coinbase Oracle that publishes signatures on prices and things like this. And the way that they benefit from this is that people use them for trading because, um, you know, they have the data uh, freely available for people. Um, and then there are likely other reasons. I mean, I, I know at least one person who's doing this just for fun because it's not, you know, it, setting up an Oracle. It's a, it's a free world, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the main two reasons that come to mind is you can sell signatures directly or you can give away signatures for free for other reasons. Um, and then maybe, you know, groups of people can have a vested interest in having good oracles for other reasons. Um, yeah. Ben, any other reasons? Um, I'd say another good point to keep in mind is like being an oracle has almost no barrier to entry. You need like yeah. to produce public keys and signatures. That's like not even a hundred bytes. So all you have, it's like, there's almost no overhead. So. Yeah, in There's the future, really no I think there will be open source oracles that anyone can run for, you know, yeah. anything that they are able to like uh, web crawl and scrape off the internet or anything like this. 
um, and you know, likely users will choose to at least spread their trust out, you know, and some trusted people and some random open source people who are running some open source code kind of spread out your trust to protect yourself against, you know, malicious oracles. So kind of speaking about spreading out your trust, like what would that actually look like? Can you have a DLC with multiple oracles that have to like, you know, redundant oracles or do you have to, um, is that just like all of your DLC activity? You're just not going to use the same Oracle for all of them. Like, what does that look like? Yeah. So it's actually that for a single DLC, you can use multiple oracles. Um, this is where it gets into the kind of fancier crypto math, but, um, how we're actually enforcing these Oracle signatures is we're, uh, tweaking these, um, CET signatures and hence having adapter signatures. And so what you do if you want to use multiple oracles is you tweak multiple times. So you like, in some sense, you take multiple different oracles and you use all of them to tweak your signature so that only if all of these signatures get published, will you then um, be able to spend that CET. So it's per DLC, you're able to compose multiple oracles. Um, and I, I was a little hand wavy there, but yeah, essentially, um, it, that's mostly how it works, at least at a high level. Um, but yeah, per every DLC, users can choose to kind of spread out their trust amongst multiple oracles reporting on that event. Um, and then, you know, also if they want between DLCs, they can switch up between oracles. Yeah, and keep in mind too, you don't need to do like a five of five, like all five oracles have to produce the result. You could do like a three of five. So yeah. if two of them go bad, then your DLC is in compromise. You know, you just throw away those signatures and use the ones you want. Yeah, and in some sense, you always should do something like this because like, you know, mistakes happen and Oracle might go offline. It doesn't necessarily have to be compromised. You know, say there's an earthquake and their data center goes down. Like you want to make sure that uh, you're not affected by that earthquake. So it's, it's always good practice, at least in the future, once this is possible, once we have the mechanisms for uh, kind of supporting this, um, people should and hopefully will be using multiple oracles in kind of this threshold way. So you guys talked about this a little bit during the presentation, but what would you say are like the Bitcoin technologies that exist today slash are in the works that complement DLCs the best? And what's like the ideal Bitcoin stack that includes DLCs? <laughs> Taproot. Uh, yeah, so um, Taproot, you know, works well with DLCs for lots of reasons. One of them is uh, if you think back to that first picture uh, on-chain footprint slide. Um, now it just looks like, you know, normal Bitcoin activity every time you're doing a DLC. There's no multi-sig to be seen on-chain. You can just use Musig once you have Taproot. Um, so that's uh, definitely something, you know, that would be nice to have in an ideal world. Um, I, I mentioned PTLCs quite a few times. I think uh, for all things Lightning, uh, it's really neat to have PTLCs instead of HTLCs. Uh, in order to do things with DLCs and, you know, they, it kind of goes both ways. They complement each other. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, in the future where we have taproot based PTLC lightning channels where you can execute discrete log contracts across the network without having any on-chain footprint of any kind, that would be neat. Oh, uh, and then I guess uh, even more futuristic, if we ever get SIG hash no input, then you're still off chain in a giant channel factory and a bunch of people get together in that channel factory and they execute a mixed DLC coin join, I guess, <laughs> would be as far as I can take this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it and then you transfer your position out of it, I guess would be the, the cherry on top. You can also <laughs> flip the question on its head and say like DLCs, like since it's just modifying signatures basically is like the main core part of it that can be applied to almost any like crypto systems. So I, I mean, yeah. so any new technology that Bitcoin adds, most likely Bitcoin or uh, DLCs will be completely compatible with it. So yeah, it in some improve. sense, the, the fundamental tool that powers DLCs is the same fundamental tool that powers routing on the Lightning Network. So, uh, you know, this idea of uh, like this, the idea of an HTLC is in some sense like an atomic swap, uh, a secret for um, uh, a payment. And in this case, that secret is a, is a signature, an Oracle signature, whereas it's a hash pre-image on, on the Lightning Network. And um, 
with PTLCs, this in some sense gets unified. Like in some sense, every PTLC is like a tiny little discrete log contract with a really weird Oracle. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really convergent with a lot of the other work that's happening on, uh, on Bitcoin right now. That's awesome. It's, it's exciting to hear how, how well these pieces kind of all fit together. Um, do you guys, slight, slight side uh, topic, but do you guys have any opinions around uh, soft fork to activations and uh, BIP8 versus BIP9 versus something else? Let's ben. go to Ben, because I know you have uh, BIP8 in yeah. your Twitter name already. <laughs> yeah, I'm pro BIP8. Uh, we're actually going to be doing some blog posts about this soon, so we get to go into nitty gritty, but um, I'm kind of with, if you've been following the RSC logs, Greg Maxwell's kind of invoicing, you know, let's just do it because we've probably trimmed all the fat from SegWit and people are probably just overcomplicating. And I think BIP8 is like early, you know, we're just going to, we'll wait for miners to upgrade. If they don't, well, screw them and we're going to get our upgrades. So, and there's a lot less worry than SegWit because you know, the, the mining software doesn't need to change. It's always just for changing SegWit uh, v1 transactions, making some of them invalid now. So yeah, I think it's a good way. I personally haven't formed an opinion yet, but I assume I will be forming one as I am reviewing Ben's blog post outcoming <laughs> at some point soon. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, unless you have anything else that you want to chime out uh, or uh, chime on or, or address the audience with, uh, I think we can wrap it up. Cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess uh, check out the slides. Uh, plenty of cool links on there, some diagrams, some pictures underneath the slides about transfers and coin joins and all these kinds of things uh and yeah feel free to hit us up on twitter or you know email or irc you know wherever you'll find us or check out our blog we have like a million oh, yeah. blog posts about We've written about DLCs, all of this <laughs> what have you so um lots of cool yeah. stuff there if you want to know about more about bitcoin and dlcs yeah and we've got more blog posts coming out soon about schnorr tappert stuff so. Amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, keep up the good work at Shirt Bits. I feel like uh, you guys are not mentioned enough as one of like the awesome Bitcoin developed uh, or Bitcoin focused development organizations. So um, I'm excited to uh, to get some of your work out there and uh, excited to uh, to continue following all the amazing stuff that you guys build. Um, let's transition out again. Thanks so much for for coming on and uh, giving the presentation to Dov and Ben. Uh, and thank you to everyone who watched. Uh, keep an eye out for the next Technical Tuesday uh, and all the other great stuff coming from Bitcoin Magazine.